Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Please join me now in welcoming Bill Demchek. Thank you, Dean Damon. Um, and let me also offer my congratulations to all the graduates uh, and their friends and family uh, who are in attendance today. Um, I am thrilled to be here this afternoon, um, you know, just given the, the wonderful partnership that PNC has had and will continue to grow with the Tepper School and Carnegie Mellon. Um, it also has the added benefit of being one of the few speeches you can actually give where you're graded almost exclusively on the brevity of your comments. <laughs> You know, I actually live um, just a short way up the hill from here, uh, and as I was making my way um, down to, to join you this afternoon, um, I was actually reflecting on um, a debate, an argument, that's well, a debate, not an argument, that I was having with my wife this morning um, over whether or not we should get my young daughter, Sydney, a cell phone. And I'll tell you, my, my wife and I actually rarely argue, um, but we frequently, we frequent, frequently debate, um, and in many ways, we're polar opposites on everything. She, we're different religions, we have different political affiliations, um, we listen to different music. Uh, she's really, really, really smart, and at least according to my teenage boys, me not so much. <laughs> but as I thought about, you know, this, this debate we had um, this morning, I was coming down here, I realized that, you know what, I actually, I held my own. I did, I did pretty well on this, I had an informed view, I didn't just raid my, or raise my voice to loud, louder and louder levels under some assumption that that would carry the day. Um, and I wasn't simply saying that, well, come on, all of Sydney's friends have a cell phone, she should get one too. I actually was expressing an informed opinion, and it was my own opinion. And as I thought about that, I realized that I kind of owed that to my wife. You know, through the years, she's helped to teach me how to think for myself, how to be self-critical, to know facts, to express what I believe in, and to balance my own goals with the needs of society and the greater good. And most importantly, she's reinforced in me my lifelong habit of always asking why. And I'd like to spend my short time with you this afternoon kind of talking about this. You know, you're graduating into a world that is much, much more complex and rapidly changing than the world was when I graduated. And we haven't left it in terribly great shape for you either. Um, we've got incredible challenges in the economy and wealth distribution, health care, government deficits, entitlements, energy policy, environmental issues, geopolitical conflict. Unfortunately, I could kind of go on and on and on of the issues that we're faced with as a society today. We also live in a world where what is legal, what is ethical, and what is right are not always the same with societal norms actually skewing towards what is legal as the binding constraint, and with the government trying to mandate ethics by law. You're graduating into a world where news and information flies at you with the speed of light. You know, information facts are gathered in sound bites from an infinite number of sources, a variety of mediums. Opinions are repeated as facts, and Walter Cronkite is no longer around on the six o'clock news to tell us what's actually going on in the world. Now, we all know the value of informed opinions. That's, that's a pretty simple statement. Yet we're so pressed for time in our lives today that in spite of all the information we consume through all of the different sources available to us, we're increasingly likely to form opinions without all of the facts and based on information provided by outlets whose profit model is basically driven by their ability to polarize us in order to create a stable and reliable audience. Now, why is, why is this relevant? Why do I want to talk about this? We heard dear Dean Damon said it, you're about to embark on your careers, and you're going to succeed or fail based on the firm that you choose, what industry is it in, what kind of culture does it have, um, hard work, who you get as a boss, whether or not you're lucky, luck matters. And at least in my case, never losing the child's wonder of always asking and understanding why. 
you go to work for a large firm, you're going to enter an environment where there's going to be enormous pressure to conform. Early on in your career, success tends to be measured by excelling in a process that's predefined for you. We do things the way people around us do things. We strive for consensus. We enter into a stupor of groupthink, and we celebrate the success of the team. And all the while, we quietly forget to form our own opinions. We forget to ask why. There's been a lot written about the root cause, causes of the financial crisis. You know, it's a housing bubble created by ill-advised federal policies in support of home ownership. It's out of control financial innovation. It's unethical, um, conflicted, and sometimes illegal behavior on the part of financial firms, banks, brokers, mortgage brokers, rating agencies, um, and consumers themselves. But what's not written about are the people who were complicit in the problems because they just went along. The salespeople who sold what they were told to sell, who dealt with customers the way they were taught to deal with customers, the managers all up and down the food chain and the companies who read the glowing profit reports without ever understanding how or why the profits came to be, the consumers who bought larger homes than they could ever possibly afford simply because their friends were doing the same. You know, Chuck Prince, the former chairman of Citigroup, is going to forever be famous and haunted by his comment that when the music is playing, you have to get up and dance, and we are still dancing. Well, he was still dancing while Rome was burning. And would he really have been dancing had he taken the time to learn and understand what the term super senior meant, and exactly how much of this thing called super senior did he in fact own? I'll always remember, and you guys will probably remember, Fabulous Fab, the mortgage salesman from Goldman Sachs. As he was testifying in, co in front of Congress about some subprime mortgage securitization um, he had sold. And I'm absolutely convinced that he completely believed that he had done nothing wrong. He simply did what he was taught to do. He played the game the way he was taught to play it. Yet as it played out in public, as we watched this happen, it was clear to everyone else that the sale of the security was at least ethically wrong, um, if not illegal. You know, think about it. He sold a leveraged subprime investment whose underlying securities were purposefully selected as the worst of the worst, and he didn't think that was relevant information to tell his client. Now, how would he feel if he went and he bought a used car and that car was made up of parts from all the broken cars that had gone in there to be serviced before, and nobody bothered to tell him? How did he operate in a state that didn't cause him to think through the long-term implications of what he was doing day to day? All of these individuals are individuals who forgot to ask why. They trusted the system they were brought up in, they conformed, they were complacent, and they were out to maximize their personal marginal utility curve without any constraint placed on that based on the impact on society. Now, I'm sure, and, and Dean Damon assures me that there are ethics classes at Carnegie Mellon, and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and I'm sure you all studied in that class. The problem with these classes, my experience, is they tend to expose you to visible issues where you need to make a choice. And my experience is actually that many, if not most, ethical breaches that occur um, happen without the individual ever realizing that they were, in fact, making a choice. They're so busy with their job that they don't step back from the day-to-day -to, -day to try to understand the impact of their actions on all parties involved. Now, I actually spent, I've been at PNC for 11 or 12 years, but I spent most of my career in New York City. Um, I grew up in the derivative business, and I ran the team at the old JP Morgan that had a large role in the creation of credit derivatives and synthetic securitizations. I was actually in the room when the term super senior was coined. All of these products were at the heart of the financial crisis. I ran a large team of people who had an incredible informational and analytical advantage over our customers. We had weapons of mass destruction, or we had the ability to power the world, depending on our actions. Now, I was also lucky enough to grow up in a firm where the client was king. We were taught to do first-class business in a first-class way. I grew up in a culture that celebrated doing the right thing irrespective of the cost. I'll tell you a story. In the, in the, in the early 90s, I took a trip out to the West Coast to see a gentleman um, named Bob Citrone, and Bob was the treasurer of Orange County, California. And he ran an investment fund that had been earning an impossibly high rate of return 
given the mandate of what the fund was supposed to do. And I had heard that he was an active derivative user with many of our competitors, so I thought I, I ought to go out there and see him. And I would tell you, Bob was, was a lovely man. He drove this beat up old Chrysler that we went to lunch in. He wore a bolero tie and he sat in this little office with a glass door that said treasurer and tax collector on it. Um, and he was, a, he was a humble, nice gentleman. And as he took me through his portfolio that afternoon, it became immediately apparent to me that he had employed massive interest rate leverage and cross-currency risk to achieve the returns that he was achieving. And he had absolutely no idea that he'd done this. And I tried to explain to him, take him through what could happen if things changed and how he could lose money. And he shook his head and he looked at me and he pulled out this dog-eared yellow tablet from his desk that he had diligently written the yields of his portfolio on every day for the last two years in number two pencil. And he looked at me and he said, son, you, you just don't seem to understand. He said, I am an arbitrageur. I went back to New York and I wrote a memo to the sales force and the compliance director that basically said we, we shouldn't deal with, with or, we should not deal with Orange County as they don't understand the risks that they're undertaking and we don't believe that those risks are in the best interest of the client. I'll tell you, we missed out on a lot of short-term revenue by me writing that memo. But my boss took that memo and he went up to our chairman and he applauded me for having written it. And probably the most proud day in my entire career was the day I was sitting on the trading desk and the chairman of J.P. Morgan, Sir Dennis Weatherstone, found his way across the floor. He was never on the trading floor, but he wandered across the trading floor and he sought me out and he, picked, he had me stand up and he shook my hand and he thanked me for doing what was right. Less than a year later, I was in Washington at a congressional inquiry over the bankruptcy of Orange County. And under oath, Mr. Citrone stated that he was misled by his financial advisor. And I tell you, it, it occurred to me, I was so saddened as I sat and listened to him speak because I was thinking back to when he described himself to me as an arbitrageur. And I realized, as he said under oath, that I was misled by my financial advisor, that he probably thought that he was perjuring himself when he said it. When in fact, he was speaking the absolute truth. You know, Bob eventually pled guilty to, to six felony counts of financial fraud and he went to jail for a year. None of the Wall Street firms were charged. They didn't do anything illegal. They also did absolutely nothing right. I left Morgan after the merger with Chase Manhattan, and in all my time running the derivative business there and structured finance, I can't think of a single customer complaint about our team acting against their interests. I'm incredibly proud of that. You know, after this crisis, and this was in the mid-90s, um, there was a very strong push to regulate derivatives. And Alan Greenspan pushed back, famously arguing that regulation could never keep up with financial innovation and could end up causing more harm than good. And he won that argument on regulation. Um, and I would tell you, despite the financial crisis, in many ways he was absolutely right. The law will never be able to keep up with the pace of change in our world. And by the way, it should not have to. What Chairman Greenspan unfortunately failed to understand was the shift and societal behavior away from what is away from doing what is right, what is ethical, what is good, to a mindset that uses the law as the binding constraint. At most companies in heavily regu regulated industries like banking, we hear a lot about creating a culture of compliance. And generally that means that you compete or you com you compete within the rule of law and the regulations that govern your industry. And good lawyers will tell you that it also means having a very strong corporate ethics program to avoid even the hint, appearance of impropriety. And that's a good start, but we can do better, and we need to aim higher. Do what is right, right by your colleagues, your clients, your communities, your shareholders, and society as a whole. To do this, you need to ask why. You need to understand why. You need to take accountability for why. You need to have an informed opinion based on facts, and you need to be willing to voice that opinion. So where do you start? Well, first, start by realizing that cable TV, needs, cable TV shows with 50,000 viewers do not always speak the gospel truth. Start by realizing that your boss and their boss or her boss are not infallible when you go to work. 
They're ordinary people. Hopefully they're out there trying to do their very best and they will need your help. They will want your help. And if they don't want your help, then get out of there and go somewhere else. Start by asking yourself the very simple question that if you had to explain to your parents what you were doing, would they be proud of you? And by the way, always asking why doesn't just help manage the bad things. It creates good things, right? It drives innovation, it, tr it causes changes for the better, and it will absolutely accelerate your careers. You know, I'm part of a generation that sometimes um, failed to heed that advice. And so my wish for you as you step out into the world is that you will aim for that higher standard, that you'll chase your dreams with intense energy, you'll drink in information to mold informed opinions, and that you'll stand boldly for what is right, even above what is legal, and that you'll do better than we have. Congratulations again and thank you.